Hello, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're joining in from today. Welcome to another live session at The Reactors. Before we get into the session, please take a moment to read our code of conduct. We're all here to learn, so please be respectful of other people's views, understanding of differences, and please be kind and considerate in the way you engage. The chat will be open throughout, and we do encourage you all to participate. Today, we are back with the third episode of Introduction to R, and, with, and in this episode, we'll be talking about classification models by using R and tidy models. And yet again, this episode will be led by Carlota, who's a cloud advocate at Microsoft, and Eric, who is a data scientist and researcher at Leeds Institute of, for Data Analytics. Um, so I'm gonna add Carlota now to the stream. Um, hi, Carlota. Hi, Rav. Hello. Hello, Hello. Everyone. Over to you now. So let me know if you need anything. I'll be in the background. Sure. Thank you. So hello. Hi, everyone. Um, and welcome to this uh, third episode of the um, R for Data Science series. So today, as Rav just mentioned, we are going to deal with classification models and uh, with R and tidy models framework. Um, I'm very excited to, to start. So uh, just for those who might join the, this series to this episode, um, let me briefly introduce myself. I'm Carlotta Castelluccio, Cloud Advocate at Microsoft. I'm focused on machine learning and AI technologies, and I'm passionate about the use in education. And I'm thrilled to have here today Eric. Hi, Eric. How are you? Hey, hello, Carlotta. How are you doing? Fine. Really Perfect. great. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. Nice to meet you again. Nice to be here. Uh, so, my name is Eric. I am a data scientist and researcher at the University of Leeds. And uh, yeah, I'm pumped to be here doing another uh, walkthrough of our entire models, this time focusing on classification. So, let's get started, Carla, all right? Yeah, right. So uh, just before starting, I, I wish to uh, remember to our um, attendees that we have a great learn mod, uh, learning path on MS Learn that you can check um, we, on creating machine learning models with R. And in particular, this episode is based on the third module of the learning path. And you can find the, the link on this deck, but I'm sure that also Rav is sharing with you uh, the link in the chat. So feel free to navigate through the module uh, during this presentation, but also maybe um, uh, after it. So now uh, let's have a quick overview of our learning objectives for today. Um, in this workshop, uh, we'll be dealing with, of course, what is classification and in which type of scenarios you should choose to use a classification model. We will talk also about training and evaluating a binary classification model. And finally, we'll be dealing with creating a multi-class classification model, and we'll be putting into practice some of these theoretical concepts with an hands-on challenge. So Eric, do you mind to introduce us to classification? So what is classification and how we can use it? Yes, sure, Carlotta. Thanks. Thanks for giving us that brief of what we're to be doing today. And yeah, let's 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 discuss what classification is. You know, so classification um simply is a form of supervised machine learning, in which you train a model to predict which category an item belongs to and with which probability it does. So just to recap from what we've been talking um in the previous lessons, you know, classification uh you know, classification being supervised machine learning uh, means that it chooses a training set to teach models to yield the desired output. And this training data set includes inputs and correct outputs, which allow the model to learn over time. You know, let's take a simple example. Let's say we have a health clinic where we want to use uh, electronic health records of a patient, such as the patient's height, the weight, the blood pressure, or blood glucose to predict whether a patient is diabetic or not. So uh, we could use a classification algorithm to feed a subset of the data uh, to a function that can generate the probability for each label of the, of the observations in our data. So and the each label means whether a patient is diabetic or not. So we can then use the remaining 
data, uh, the remaining subset of the data to evaluate the model by comparing the predictions uh, that uh, uh, our train model uh, produces to the actual observed labels. And then uh, at that point, you can you know, evaluate how well the model performs. And, you know, at its core, this is the basic premise of what classification is. And uh, yeah, um, let's see how we can deal with it and how we can fit examples in our subsequent slides and uh, later on challenge. So Carlotta, over to you. Uh, no. Sure. So uh, let's start by dealing with, uh, let's say, the most, the easiest form of classification, which is binary classification. Um, a binary classification model answers to a yes/no type of question. Uh, so recalling the clinic scenario just mentioned by Eric, uh, we are going to deal with uh, the question: Does this patient suffer from diabetes? So um, this is a yes/no type of questions, uh, and the the category uh, the, the answers could be two. So the categories uh, could be two, uh, zero, which means a negative, so the patient is not diabetic, and one, which he, which means um, positive, so the the patient suffers from diabetes. And uh, here we go with a good example. Uh, and for sake of simplicity, only one predictive feature in this case is considered. Um, and this feature is the blood glucose level of the patient. So the deficit displayed in the left side of the deck has two columns. The feature X, which is um, the blood glucose level, and the label Y, which is the known label that we want our model to um, learn to predict. And, and let's uh, start by splitting the data set into two subsets, we, a, a bigger one, which is the training data, data set that we will use to train the model, and this smaller one, which is the test data set, and which is used to evaluate the model. Remind that training a model means finding the mathematical equation able to calculate the category given the features, and in this case, the only feature, which is the blood glucose level. Let's start then by plotting the training values for X and Y on a chart. In this simple example, you can see from the chart that patients with a low blood glucose level are all non-diabetic, while patients with a higher blood glucose level are all diabetic. So it, it seems that the higher the blood glucose level, the more probable it is that the patient is diabetic, with the inflection point being somewhere between 100 and 110. So we need at this point to fit a function that calculates a value between 0 and 1 for y to these values. And this function in this case is a logistic function that's the best fit for the data sample, uh, forming a sigma dial S-shaped curve as in the plot. Now we can use this function to calculate a probability value that y is positive, meaning that the patient is diabetic from any value of x by finding the point on the function line for x. We can then set a threshold value uh, of 0 0.5 as the cutoff point for the class label prediction, and then visualize the predicted labels for the de test dataset features. We can observe that points plotted below the threshold line yield a predicted class of 0, so are assigned to the category non-diabetic while points above the line are predicted as one, so as diabetic. And in the additional column below, we can see the same values of y hat in a tabular form. At this point, we can compare the label predictions based on the logistic function encapsulated in the model, uh, what we call the y hat, to the actual label class that we call y, in order to evaluate how well the model performs. And we used the test data set to evaluate, to evaluate models' performance because the training accuracy of a classification model is much less important than how well that model works when it's given new and seen data. Uh, but I let Eric better explain which kind of measures we can use for evaluating a, a binary classification model. So over to you, Eric, to evaluate the model we just built. All right, Carlotta, thanks. Thanks a lot for that uh, that great explanation. I really loved how you said um, how, how you know, the, the, the core essence is, how, is seeing how a model performs on new data. 
And that brings us to, you know, evaluating classification models, which is really one of the most important parts in the whole model building process. So after we've built uh, and trained a classification model, we should, you know, evaluate how well it performs on nuancing data so we can get, you know, a, a better glimpse of how it would perform on real on real world data, how it perform out there, you know. So um, just to recall uh, on, on the table on the right, on the left, I mean, um, recall that X, you know, is, is the blood glucose level, Y is uh, the actual observed labels for the patient is diabetic or not, with a zero representing not the, uh, the patient is not diabetic and one representing the patient is diabetic and my heart refers to the predictions that the model made. So, you know, we can decide, you know, as, as fast to first calculate, uh, you know, the accuracy by just simply comparing Y and Y hat to see uh, which um, which observations are pr correctly predicted. You know, so some, sometimes, you know, this, this is all right, but often in real world data, where, especially when the data is very unbalanced, where you find you have uh, one, one label having more observations than the other, uh, simply calculate the accuracy might be too misleading or a bit simplistic to help understand the kind of errors the model make in real world. So um, to get more detailed performance, we have, we consider something known as the confusion matrix, uh, shown on the left, shown on the right. I mean, yeah. So uh, so the confusion matrix here describes how well a classification model performs by tabulating how many examples in each class were correctly classified and also how many were correct, how, how many were wrongly classified. Yeah, so um, let's let's get into the gist of what uh, a confusion matrix is and what it contains. So you can see some few labels there that you'll, that you'll be trying to define. So let's start with uh, a scenario, you know, where a model predicts, uh, where the model predicts uh, a patient as being positive and they are actually positive. And so in reality, they would call these a true positive. And the true positive is shown at the bottom right uh, number there. So you have two observations that were um, correctly identified by the model. Uh, the, the, the patient was positive and, uh, and, and the model predict them as positive. So that's one scenario. So another scenario would be when a model predicts a patient as being negative and they belong to, and they are actually positive. So the patient, uh, so the model predicted the patient was negative, and they are actually positive in real life. So this is what we call a false negative, and the false negative is shown by the uh, bottom left number there. So we have uh, one instance where the uh, where the model predicted the patient as being negative, and they were actually positive. All right. So let's go to our scenario where the model predicts uh, a patient as being positive. Uh, but in actual sense, they are negative, so they're diabetic. So this is what you call a false positive, and shown by the uh, top right number there. Uh, so we had one one patient who, uh, where the model predicted they were positive, but in reality they were non-diabetic, they were negative. So that's what we, that's what to call a false positive. And lastly, we have can have a scenario where the uh, model predicts a patient as being negative and in reality, they're actually negative. This, this is what you call a true negative and shown by the uh, by the top left number there. So we had two observations where the uh, model predicted uh, patients as being non-diabetic and they were actually non-diabetic. So this gives us a better estimate of how the model performed uh, and why it's making mistakes or it's quite, and how it's really doing great. And the good thing about the confusion matrix, we can get other metrics associated um, with it. So for instance, we can have a metric such as the accuracy, which you just described. And this just gives us uh, a simple answer to the question of all the predictions, how many were correct. And this is given by the true positive plus true negative over everything else. So over the sum of the true positives and the true negatives and the false positives and the false negatives. So that's one metric that can arise from the confusion matrix. So another one that can arise is called the recall. And the recall just answers the simple question of all the cases that were positive, how many did the model identify? So um, this is given by the true positive or true positive plus false negative. And then we can have another such as the precision and the precision just tells us of all the cases that the model predicted to be positive, 
uh, how many were actually positive and it's given by two positive over two positive plus four positive so um yeah i know uh, sometimes these uh metrics uh they, they can be confusing and really hard to remember sometimes also i also have to google them up so the good thing is that there's uh this framework so such as tidy models and uh um and you know others in other languages so they have really good documentation that you can just uh you know refresh your mind and then uh, uh they have functions that can allow you to you know to, to calculate this once you have a glimpse of what you want to do so so worry not in, in uh in, in real world out there, you, you, you have good documentation to help guide you. So look at some of these metrics and uh, and also more in, in our upcoming challenge module. But yeah, that's just some some of the ways that you can evaluate classification models. So over to you, Kawata. Yeah, thank you, Eric, for um, giving us an explanation how we can evaluate a binary classification model. Um, but in some cases, we would need to classify an object in more than, than two categories. And in this case, a binary classification is not enough anymore. We need a multi-class classification model. Um, and uh, to make a very simple example, a multi-class classification model is able to answer to a type of question like the following. So to which class does the shape belongs to? And we have more than two options available as an answer. So in this case, we have a square, a circle, and a triangle, so three shapes. Fortunately, in most machine learning frameworks, including tidy models, implementing a multi-class classification model is not significantly more complex than implementing a binary classification. In fact, multi-class classification can be thought as a combination of multiple binary classifier. And we have two ways in which we can approach the problem. We have the one versus rest approach in which a classifier is created for each possible class value with a positive outcome for cases where the prediction is a certain class and a negative outcome for cases where the prediction is any other class. For example, a classification problem with three possible shape classes as um, we have square, circle and triangle would require, would require three classifiers that predict if the shape is square or not, if the shape is circle or not, or if the shape is triangle or not. On the other hand, the one versus one approach um, requires us to build a classifier for each possible pair of classes. So the classification problem with three shape classes would require the following binary classifiers, square or circle, square or triangle, circle or triangle. In both approaches, the overall model must take into account all these predictions to determine which single category the item belongs to. But we probably have talked uh, a lot for now, so let's put some of these concepts in practice with a hands-on challenge. And so let's make our, our um, uh, let's make dirty with by digging with some R code. Um, and for this challenge, let's imagine that we are data scientists in a wine-making company, tasked with working with the company's wine records and wine experts to produce the best wine. In this hands-on workshop, we'll train a, a multi-class classification model to analyze the chemical and visual features of wine samples and classify them based on the grape variety, so on the cultivar. So Eric, can you um, show us how we can access the, the code of this challenge and how um, attendees can go with us uh, through the workshop code? Yeah, sure, Carlotta. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, yes, Carlotta hinted earlier, we, we have a new learning path. So uh, so what you need to go is uh, click the link that's on that's been provided, that this will lead you to the introduction to classification models using our entity models. So once you browse the, uh, to that link, uh, we have a challenge on unit nine. So this basically meant for you to practice what you've been learning in unit one to eight. So once you click that and you uh, have to sign in um, there to activate the sandbox, a sandbox with, um, with all the data and, and uh, all the packages installed so you can just 
just have to go there and you know start writing code and uh coding along with us so we invited code along with us and um uh, ask questions and uh, provide hints if you have other alternatives and yeah let's uh let's make this uh uh collaborative session so let's uh let's let's get right into it right yeah sure let's start so i will ask you eric to uh maybe share your screen and um start the challenge perfect but you did tell you me right. uh, yep uh is is my screen um how, can you see my screen now yeah 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 we can perfect perfect yes so i have already uh activated mine three times now so yes so that's a good thing right so um yeah so let's let's uh let's let's kick off this challenge so we were training uh classification word classify wine data is called has has graceful introduced us to so um so just ju ju just a bit of uh preview we have here the y expert identify wines from specific vineyards through smell and taste but the factors that give different wines the individual characteristics are actually based on the chemical composition so here we try to train a model to analyze the chemical and visual features of wine samples and then classify them based on their grape variety so here we have a uh uh a jupyter notebook it's a uh, very similar to what we have in in our markdown or quarto so this what this just uh enables us to have um a notebook where you can write text you can write code and you can see your analysis and uh just with this good reproducible uh notebook for you to uh to modify and um and remodify and also sometimes share your findings so let's hit the ground running by you know uh kicking off the challenge so we 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 start by um you know fast loading the required packages into our our environment so um yeah so we would start with uh installing uh this this file called janitor which could just not come by default so that's what you start uh installing it with you can just simply install the packages janitor and then you can provide the the repo uh cran.rstudio.com uh this will help in uh getting the correct um version of it i would say so yeah so once that is done we load in our packages using the library command as always so library tidyverse so tidyverse is this collection of packages that make data science easier and fast and fun uh we've we've we've, we've uh, gone through some of them so the ggplot and dplyr in our previous uh previous um you know challenges so you also load the tidy models uh collection of packages for doing modeling and machine learning r then we have here library here to tell you know um uh the notebook the repo the the, the direct repository we are in and uh yeah, and library janitor that you know for helping us clean some of the um the the, the columns in our data once we once we load the packages we can then load our data so into our environment so it's a csv file so we read csv um yeah and then we can print the first few rows of the data using uh the slice head uh and then this uh providing the number of rows with one so um Carlotta, here's our wine data and famous wine data so uh do you mind walking us through some of the features that we'll be dealing with yeah yeah of course so let's um give an overview of this data set we'll be dealing with so this data set contains uh, 14 columns providing information about the different wine samples like for example alcohol content color intensity uh, you and a few chemical features as well and the label we want our classification model learn to, to predict is the wine variety um the wine variety column and not as all the data set columns are of type double including the wine category uh, so we'll probably need some data reformatting before getting started um, 
But let me say that our challenge will be to explore the, this data set and train a multi-class classification model uh, able to achieve an overall recall metric of over 95%. Um, if we recall the confusion metrics in the introductory index, this means that the positive rate or better the ratio between true positive in all classes and the sum of true positives and false negatives in all classes should be greater than 0 0.95. And this challenge is structured in seven questions that will guide us in building the classification model. For each question, we have a few line of codes to complete uh, by filling out blank spaces. And we encourage you to follow us along the notebook. You have the, the challenge unit link. So go ahead um, and follow the, the, the challenge with us. And maybe also try to guess uh, the, the answer. But of course, we will give you um, for each one the, the, our solution. Um, feel free to interact with us using the chat if you want, for example, to share your solution, to share your guess, or to ask for some, um, for some clarifications, for example. Um, right, so I think we are uh, ready. I, I gave all the uh, information about the challenge. I think we can start with, the, with question one. So as I mentioned before, uh, our first task will be to reformat a little bit the data, and in particular, the label column, so the wine variety column, uh, to make it easier for a classification model uh, to use it effectively. So question one asks us to encode wine variety into a categorical variable uh, using three levels, zero, one, and two. So, Eric, we've done this sort of encoding before in our previous uh, sessions, right? But this is the first time, if I remember correctly, that we use levels um, in this type of encoding. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more on how we can, how are we are using levels in this case. Yeah, fantastic holiday. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as um. Yeah, as we hinted to all, you've been using, you know, a de facto function to reformat um, variables to categorical. So, so the fact also takes uh, factor factor function also takes a uh, levels argument. So the levels uh, they basically are allows you to define the order in which you want um, those factor variables to be in. So for instance, uh, this could be useful probably in when you want to plot and you want to assign certain colors to certain levels. So if you start with zero, one, and two, probably zero would be color red, one would be another color. So if you say two, one, zero, uh, they'd be also assigned different uh, you know, different different colors. So it's just a way of um, specifying the order in which you want the various categorical variables in your column. To be, yeah, to be ordered, yes. Yeah, so that's how I say levels simply are. Thank you. Great. So, given that, I think we can go ahead and solve our first question, right? Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So, okay. So let's. Uh, how do we begin? Begin again. This is just repetition. Uh, like, you know, loading the library Jarita to help us in cleaning the names here. Just converting them to to snake case that we are, um, are used to in R. So yeah, so let's start. So we have the wine data and then, so this is a pipe operator in R used to pass a uh, data set on the left to a function on the right. So uh, it's read as end then in R allows you to chain multiple transformations of the data as it goes through multiple functions. So for instance, here I want to take the wine data and then we want to encode the wine variety uh, column as a category. So, and then we want to mutate. So mutate allows you to either create a new column or to modify an existing column. And for instance, here we want to modify this existing column called wine variety. Uh, and then we want to encode it into a categorical variable. So we want to, uh, to encode that to use the factor function. So wine variety will be encoded into a categorical variable. So uh, factor wine variety. Uh, and then we want our, th those uh, 
our our our, our observations to be to be um you know to be rearranged in the order of uh zero so the level sticks in a uh, numeric uh, uh, um, um a character variable so zero one and uh two sorry 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 yeah zero one and two so that's how we uh, we encode so we mutate or we modify the one variety uh, column into a categorical one uh, with the levels ordered at zero one two and then we pass them to another function called clean names from janitor which will convert uh, them from uh, this this naming convention to a snake case such as this one and yes uh, after that we um, we can briefly view our data using the glimpse uh, function which transposes this view we had here to a more column like view as we will see here so perfect so uh that's how we have it now we have a wine variety it was a double now it's a factor variable uh so it's a categorical variable now so again we can test our answers uh using this code chunk that has an outer grading solution called otter that allows you know to to check whether your answer is correct and provides with some hints here and there uh and yep yeah, uh seems our um our encoding was correct so yeah so Carlotta, that is done so next i think we're going to data exploration right before modeling um will you be able to comment on that yeah yeah um of course so before uh, jumping to modeling the second step of that exploration will include understanding the relationships between attribute attributes in the data uh, that means spotting any correlation between uh, the features and the label um, that the model will try to predict. So a uh, question to guides us um, actually in doing this by asking us to restructure the data in a way to be easily plotted in subplots. Uh, and we'll do this by leveraging on um, two verbs, pivot longer and facet wrap. I'd like to remember that pivot longer, we already saw it in the last uh, session about the regression. So pivot longer converts the data set into a three columns table in which the column features contain all the names of the predictive features. So the columns heading of the original data set and the column values contains the corresponding values for, for those features. And uh, the third column is of course the label. So wine variety in this case. Um, so what about facet wrap, Eric? Can you tell us more about uh, the, the other verb we are introducing with this uh, chunk of code? Yeah, sure, 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 Carla. So facet trap will see it uh, when we get to the data visualization part. So facet trap uh, just simply allows you, allows you to take a column with multiple, um, with, with mo also with multiple levels and uh, allows you to make a plot for each uh, for each level. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a simple and very intuitive way of uh, of making subplots out of one column. So it allows us to avoid writing loops and all uh, to make multiple columns for multiple things. So as you'll see in a short while. So, but for now, let's let's first pivot long at the data and then see how we can leverage pivot uh, face a trap to to do that. So uh, shall we get started, Kalata? Yeah, yeah, let's pivot longer our data. Okay, perfect, perfect. So um, uh, the questions require us to structure the data. Uh, so uh, pivot longer the data. So, uh, so the all existing columns except the wine variety now fall under a new column called features and the corresponding values, and a new column called values. So how would we do that? So we start with the wine variety data and then if we pivot longer uh, such that uh, all columns except, so this is no, uh, this R says except the wine variety. So accept our our outcome. Uh, so accept the wine variety uh, goes to, um, so we pivot longer all the columns except the wine variety uh, so that their corresponding 
our names they fall under new a new column there known as features uh and their corresponding values uh now fall under new name uh variable name called values so uh we can see this uh let's just create a new code chunk yeah, and you can see what you're talking about so what probably longer all all the columns so what will let's um let's also create uh let's see how they looked like before and then how they look like after so when why in data and then let's say slice head um n is equals to three just to have a glimpse and then we probably longer uh let's run this so this was what we had before and now what are we doing now we pivot longer the data such that all these columns except the wine variety now fall under a new column known as features and their corresponding um values fall under a new column known as values so as you can see uh these features uh has all the uh, all the other columns and the values as the corresponding values of those uh uh corresponding columns so this now allows us to use facet trap to make a plot for uh, uh, uh what are we making we're making a box uh box plot here for all the 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 values under this new column called feature so for all this uh all these previous um columns such as alcohol malic acid ash now we make a box plot for each so without having to do any loops and all so how do you do that so we start um so we we start with the wine data long so this is the this 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 will store the results of this so we did the we pivot longer and then we assign that to uh to uh um to a variable to a name called wine data long so that's how that the, the result of that operation will be stored in wine data long let's so start with one data long and then we ggplot to pass it on to ggplot so ggplot uh, is a legal part, elegant package for doing data visualizations in r so when you pass the ggplot you need to tell where ggplot will plot uh will put the various aesthetics so you want uh, x aesthetic to go to the wine variety and the values to be mapped to the one uh to the y aesthetic and then we'll fill the box plot with the corresponding values of features so, so that each box plot uh for different um so for different uh variables will have different colors and then we specify the particular plot you want using geom uh so like the geom um, function so if you want a box plot we'd say geom box plot uh and then we will add a facet trap to the layer so we say facet trap and then we'll say we want to make subplots of the features uh of all the observations in the features column uh and then we'll say we'll set scales is equals to three so that they can have each each of them can, can have their own individual scales uh and then we'll say the number of columns that you want so i'll just be running this and then the next one is just to add a color um you know just a color library so we say we want because you said you want to to have different colors for each different um observation so we just specify what color library we want and what scale color viridis and then we want the plasma the plasma um coloring and yes uh and then we say don't give us a legend so we said legend of position is equals to none so this is very similar to what we've been doing previously now this gives us a box plot for each um you know different um observation in the features column so as we can see we can see um this uh this this different uh characteristic of the wine such as alkalinity alcohol ash really uh gives us a good bit of segmentation between uh the different wine categories for instance we can see in uh let's say alkalinity we can see that um for for uh wine variety zero they have the lowest level of let's say alkalinity and followed by one and two the wine variety two has the highest level of alkalinity 
it is very different where I say when you want to see uh, the phenols that the wine contains. So you can see that um, in phenols, one variety zero has the highest amount of phenols and one variety two has the least amount of phenols based on the distribution. And so this um, you know, gives us a good glimpse of how our variables are relating to the, to the outcome, which is wine variety. And we can see that we have, we have a pretty good data set that is really segmented well. So that's a really uh, important step in helping us determine what kind of model we use uh, in, in a subsequent operation. So again, we can uh, check our answer uh, to see whether we are correct. And yes, since we have uh, perverted the longer data well, uh, and you have make, made uh, plotting faces. So in a free time, please feel free to look around, see other, uh, other uh, observations you can draw from this, from this box plot. But yeah, that's, uh, that's it for now. So yeah, Carlotta, over to you now. Um, what are we doing next? Yeah, so thank you, Eric, for, for sharing how to, um, let's say, compare these uh, these predictive features in, in our data set. Um, so we are now at our third step of the journey. And um, what we are going to do, we are going to prepare the data for training. Uh, and this means we are going to split our data set into two subsets. Uh, as we did also in the introductory decks for our very simple example of the um, clinic scenario. Uh, and the two, two subsets are one for training, so the training data set, and one for testing, the test data set used for evaluation purposes. So question three asks us to um, write a specification um, in a way to split our data set um, and putting the 70% of the data set into the training uh, and 30% of the data set into the test set. Um, so Eric, can you guide us through these um, uh, splitting specification in R? Yeah, exactly. Uh, sure, sure, Carlotta. Let's, uh, let's see how this will be done. So yeah, so now that we have a good uh, glimpse of how the variables related to the outcome, now we can split our data, uh, make a splitting specification, starting by making a splitting specification. So we load tidy models again. So um, just a repetition, I already did it earlier, just, uh, uh, just to illustrate again. So yeah, uh, at this point, we, uh, we set a seed. Uh, so just a random number that will ensure that uh, we get consistent consistent splitting because the splitting is usually very is usually random. So when you set a seed, uh, when you use this same seed, you're able to get the same splits that we got. So that said, um, let's make a splitting specification. So a splitting specification just uh, just says you know uh, this is the data that we'll use and this is the proportion that we will want. So we start with the wine data. And then we want to uh, make a splitting specification such as such that 70% will go to training and 30% will go to testing. So uh, we use the function initial split. So this is very similar that, uh, to how we did in regression. And this is really the bit of tidy models gives you that consistent um, API interface to do various machine learning tasks. So we take the initial split and then we set the proportion that you want to go to training here is 0 0.70, so 70%. So once we've done splitting specification, we can then go ahead and extract the data in its split. So Carlotta, uh, because it's very similar to what we did last time. So do you uh, remember what, what, what you used to extract the training and the testing uh, splits uh, from the splitting specification? Yeah, yeah, of course. So um, the, the syntax in this case is uh, very intuitive. So to extract, extract our training um, set, we'll be just using the verb training, uh, while to extract our test set, we're just using the verb uh, testing, right? Yes, a lot of fantastic. Yes, so let's uh, let's do exactly that. So to extract the training set, which we call line train, uh, we use the training uh, verb, 
And then to extract the testing set, we take just the testing function and put in their splitting specification. So one split. So once we do that, then we can print the rows, uh, the number of rows in each uh, in each uh, split. And uh, let's go ahead and do that. So it seems we have 124 training examples and 54 testing examples. So uh, yeah, so that's that's the data set that we have. So um, again, we can check whether we are on the right track and yep, we are on the right track. So yeah, that's it. Now uh, the journey is continuing. Now you have split. Uh, we, we, so we have we have uh, an idea of how the uh, observations, of how the uh, variables relate to the outcome. We've made a splitting specification. Um, now time to do some pre-processing with recipes. So Carlotta, would you be kind enough to uh, explain what recipes are and how they help in our uh, training journey and all that. Sure, sure. So yeah, as you just said, we are coming to the, um, let's say, the core of the of the challenge because now we are going to um, create a recipe to specify some uh, data preprocessing step. We are going to uh, write our model specification uh, and then we are going to bundle the two in a workflow object that we can use to feed our training data set. Um, uh, coming back to your question, so what a recipe is. Uh, so a recipe in R is an object collecting a set of pre-processing steps to reformat the predictor values to make them easier for a model to use effectively. And this may include transformations and encodings of the data to best represent their main characteristics, let's say. Um, so um, since this, uh, this, que this question is quite complex, uh, let's maybe break it down a little bit uh, in in three pieces. Uh, sorry, Carlota, yeah. Eric, um, would you be able to zoom in a bit? Because I, the, I think the screen is too small uh, and we're unable to see the text. Yeah, this is much better. Yes, thank you. Sorry. That's okay. That, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you no very much, Rav, for pointing these out for us. All yeah, right. so coming back to our question four, um, let's break it down a little bit and let's start from um, the first task, which is writing our model specification, right? Yeah. And in this case, um, our challenge is asking us to um, build uh, a, a multi-class classification model and in particular, a logistic regression uh, model. Um, a multinomial logistic regression model. So we talked in our introductory decks about logistic regression and log logistic regression measures the relationship between the categorical dependent variable, which is the label of our data set, and one or more independent variables, which are the features of our data set by estimating probabilities using a logistic function. So probabilities greater than um, our threshold, which was in our example 0 0.5, um, we predict category 1, while probability lower than 0 0.5 will predict category 0. Um, so what we, um, what we explained in the introductory deck is called um, sigmoidal logistic uh, or binomial function, and it is used for binary classification. But now we are dealing with multi-class classification. So we are dealing with more than two classes. And for that, we are going to use a, a multinomial type of, di of distribution. That's why we are talking about multinomial logistic regression. So given that, how we can write this model specification for a multinomial regression model in R? Eric, can you guide us through, through that? Yes, that's called. Um, yeah, and you observe this will be very similar to what we did for for um for in the regression uh, challenge. So uh, to just specify, uh, just make a model specification. We typically require um, let's say at least three things. One is the the type of model. Uh, second is the engine. 
so for, for, for instance, the type of model is, for instance, you want a multinomial regression model. The engine, uh, the second one is the engine, the engine uh, specify the package that you want to perform uh, uh, the, the, the specified function. So the function, the, the package that you want to perform the multinomial regression model. And the type, and the last one is the type of model that you want. For instance, here you want classification because some engines can do both classification and uh, regression. In some instances, we have um, some models, they have uh, particular parameters. Uh, for instance, um, uh, this engine that we call, that we'll be using here, NET, requires you to also specify a parameter called penalty. In parity specify the amount of regularization, and uh, this just helps us uh, helps the model to avoid overfitting by uh, um, uh, giving, uh, let's say, uh, a score to, to by minimizing the weights of uh, of of some of, of of the of the model parameters that the model has learned. So that's what the regularization does. It just helps us to avoid overfitting and all. So um, ideally, we would have to tune the penalty parameter, but here we just set it to one. Um, yeah, but invited to tune it as as shown uh, in the in, in the learning path where we've where we've where we've tuned several parameters for other models. Yeah, but for here we just set it to one. So let's go ahead and make this model uh, specification. So let's start with the type of model we want. So we want a multinomial uh, regression model just given us by yep. So we want a multinomial regression model. So that's the type of model we want. The second uh, uh, specification, as you said, is the engine. So we want this is the package that will fit the model. So we want the NET uh, uh, package to do that. Uh, that is the type of model we want. Um, so so we start with the uh, so that uh, is one to a classification. So uh, so the engine. And the mode, so the mode is uh, the classification, want a classification model. And the penalty for for this particular package, you know, this package requires us to set a value for penalty. So just put it to one. Or you said you can tune it um, using uh, various tuning uh, um, strategies that we discussed in, in the learning part itself. So, yeah, so that's the first thing. So we've set the, uh, the model specification. So next is doing the recipe. So um itself. So and as Carlotta said, the recipe is just a pre-processing steps that make the data um, uh you know that make it easier for the model to fit the data. So for instance, this multinomial regression model requires that the predictors should all be on the same scale so that we can avoid um values with large numbers uh, disappropriately uh, skewing the results. So uh, how do we set up a recipe? So a recipe, uh, we start it using the recipe function. So we say recipe. And then the next thing is that we give the recipe a formula. So a formula that the recipe can infer to, to be able to, um, to know what are the outcomes and what are the predictors. So for instance, here we know uh, wine variety uh, is the outcome and everything else is, uh, uh, is a predictor. So that's what uh, this, is, this, this, uh, this is what this formula tells the recipe and then tells it, you know, infer that data from the wine train. So once we do that, then we can then specify these steps that helps us um, that, 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 the, that the recipe will perform on the data. So and here want to encode, uh, want to uh, normalize everything to be on the same scale. So um, we've done this previously, and uh, probably call it. I do remind us what step uh, do we need to uh, center and scale all our numeric predictors. Sure. So, um, so let's beginning to say that uh, in a recipe, each step. Uh, starts with the uh, step underscore um, syntax, let's say, and okay. then it is followed by the type of task it is performing. 
yeah. so in this case, we are uh, scaling our numeric predictors, or better, we can say we are normalizing our numer numeric predictors, and that's why the step is called step underscore normalize. Yeah, perfect, perfect, Carlton. Thank you for for that assist. All right. So, okay. So that's uh that's that's very good. So uh so now we have a model specification, a multinational regression model specification via the NET package via the NET engine. We have a recipe that reforms the data to make uh this model fit the data well. So this recipe um normalizes the uh, normalizes all the numeric predictors. Uh, and then next is to fit this to uh, into kind of um, a legal object. So I started, uh, and then and how we do this in R is by doing a workflow. So the workflow allows you to take a preprocessor and the model specification such that when it gets new data, it will first uh, preprocess the data and then fit, um, fit the model after pre-processing the data. So allows allows this thing to allow allows the, the model specification and, and the recipe to go hand in hand. So we bundle this this uh this object using a workflow. So we instantiate a workflow using the workflow function and then we set the preprocessor is equals to the uh, the recipe. So so this is the one recipe and the model specification is uh multilinear regression specification. So now we have a workflow that encompasses the two and we can uh, print all our hard work and you can see, yes, this is the workflow, contains a preprocessor for, um, you know, uh, doing preprocessing our data to make it easier for model to fit. And then you have the model, uh, model specification that will actually, uh, uh, you know, fit the, the preprocessed data. So uh, now that we have that, we can again test uh, how we have been going along and again, you're doing good. And uh, yeah, Kawata, what is there to do now? Yeah, so we just built our workflow uh, by band, um, bundling um, the uh, model specification, the multinomial um, um, regression model specification, uh, together with our uh, recipe for the preprocessing step. Uh, and now we can actually use this workflow to feed our uh, our model on the training data set which is what oh. we are just doing with this piece of code, right? Using the fit yeah. function. Yeah, exactly, exactly to say, Carl, that yeah, um, took took a second to run, right? Uh, yeah, so we've taken the workflow uh, and then we fit to the data. So, and then we start that workflow uh, in, uh, in a name uh, in my workflow fit. So this is the fitted workflow, um, again, uh, it, it preprocessed the data using the recipe and then uh, fitted the data using the model. So yeah, as you can see, you can see uh, the you know the variable uh, the model variables that it learned while it did the training. Um, yeah, so these are the coefficients that, uh, that that help the model determine the category to which a wine variety belongs to. Now we are uh, done with training, so. Carlotta, uh, could you take us through what is uh, what we're doing next on model evaluating model performance? Yeah, yeah, of course. So um, you, if you remember, we uh, split the data set into two subsets. Uh, we just used one, the bigger uh, subset for training the model. Now we are going to use the smaller one, the test data set, to um, uh, to validate our our model and. Um, and and that's what uh, like question five uh, will ask us. So question five will ask us to predict the labels for the test data set in order to uh, validate uh, our model we just built. Um, and then um, just to like uh, give a little bit of spoiler, we will um, in the second part of the question, we are also going to plot a confusion matrix to help evaluate the model performances to understand how our model is, um, is performing because it's not very easy to understand the model performance just by um, 
using uh, pr predicting the the test um, labels, right? Yes, 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 Scala. Yeah, very well said. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So let's see. Let's uh, let's 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 uh, do the results. Let's let's see how the model uh, would perform. So the first step, as you said, is making predictions on the test data, right? So, um, so, uh, so use this um, handy function. I I really like it. We use it a lot uh, during the call. So it's augment. So augment what augment does augment takes the fitted workflow and the data. So and then it will um so it it, it will uh, fit the data and make predictions and then bind the predictions to the data. So it does a lot of hard work for us uh, behind the scenes. Of course, you can use the the the, uh, the default predict in R uh, if you're familiar with Devashila in R, but yeah, let's use uh, augment for now so we stay uh, we we'll start with augment and then we give it the um the fitted workflow so and here it is uh just copy it being very lazy i'll just copy uh mr workflow fit so the fitted workflow and then we uh want to make predictions on the test data so we called it um wine test yes wine test so uh once we do that, we, um, oops, just a minute. Yes. So uh, once we do that we, using augment, we are able to take the fitted workflow and the data. So the workflow uh, has a recipe and has a model specification to pre-process the wine tests data and then fit the fitted, uh, the trained model and then make predictions, then bind the predictions to the data. So yeah, and these are our uh, results. So we have the predicted class and also the predicted probabilities. So for instance, uh, in the first of us observation, the model has a 99% uh, confidence that the mod, that the label is zero and it was actually zero. And this varies, you know, with the different observations. So. Yeah, so as Kawada said, it's uh, really difficult to eyeball through all these observations. So the best way is uh, we calculate the coefficient matrix. Uh, but for now, let's first check uh, whether our answers are correct and they are, everything is looking uh, great. So now let's 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 make uh, the coefficient matrix. So to make it, it's really easy, especially in Terry models because you just have to take the results, just the table that we made here, um, and then uh, use the con uh, the command confusion, uh, confusion as command, so confusion matrix, you give it the truth. So these are the actually observed variables, that's one variety, and the predicted ones known as estimate, uh, and you pass the predicted variable. So in our case, dot pred class. So yeah, so give the data, give the actual label and the predicted label. So once we do that, we can uh, get a confusion matrix. And uh, yeah, it seems uh, models don't perform in that bad, you know? Uh, so let's see how we can interpret it. So we, we have uh, one variety zero that, and so when, uh, so why is that uh, uh, of, variety zero and our predicted zero was 16. Uh, those that were one and predicted as one were 22 and one, those were two that were predicted as two were 13. So ideally why we always want the diagonal to be large values because those are the truth values. So, but you can see um, our model also did some mis, mis uh, labeling. For instance, uh, one variety that was zero and but were predicted as one, we have a one instance. I also have two instances where the um, the, the the actual uh, one variety was one, and then uh, the uh, the model predicted as two. So yeah, so we see we have uh, instances uh, where the model uh, is uh, not uh, being able to really differentiate between uh, one varieties of uh, uh, variety one and variety two, and also variety zero and variety one. So, but overall, uh, this this looks good. Um, 
Yeah, but uh, it would be more intuitive to uh, see it in a graphical means. So yeah, so let's uh, let's represent this in uh, in in, in a, according to a heat map uh, that to, to bear to visualize it that way. So um, so to do this is really easy. Uh, you take uh, the results again. Um, and then um, to actually make a heat map, uh, Teddy models provide you the auto plot uh, function. So auto plot to just uh, give it what you want. For instance, you want a heat map, and then to generate the rest for, uh, to make the uh, uh, the heat map for you. So because we are inferring a heat map from the you know from the confusion matrix, we just have to again calculate the confusion matrix uh, using the command confusion matrix, confmat. Uh, so once we get this, we just then pass it on to a heat map to generate uh, uh, a, a tile plot for us. And um, yeah, I think this looks better, Carlotta, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks to the, uh, like, to, to the colors in this visualization, we can more easily identify uh, the, uh, the the correct predictions um, and see that we have a higher number of um, of items that have been correctly um, identified and assigned to the correct categories. So uh, yeah, in particular, if you have, like in, in this case, we don't have a very large dot sets, but when you have very large dot sets, heat maps help a lot. And also um, more than um, three or four labels if you have, um, or more categories. So if you have uh, a high number of categories and a large chart set, heat map definitely help a lot. All right, Carla, thanks, th thanks a lot for that. So, um, all right, Carla, seems you are doing some more uh, model evaluation, right? Uh, yeah, so um, confusion metrics is uh, helpful helpful because it gives also rise to other other metrics that can help you better evaluate the performance of a classification model. And in the introductory decks, we saw um, some of them um, starting from our confusion metrics, right? Um, and now we are going to uh, compute these metrics um, using the the, the yard yardstick package uh, and in particular we're going to compute accuracy precision and recall for our model for the model we just we just built okay okay Carlotta. thanks thanks a lot for that so and um as you would have guessed uh this really follow the you know the previous uh let's say syntax, you know, the, the syntax is it's really consistent. So for instance, if you want to calculate accuracy, you put in the accuracy uh, function, then giving the data. So, uh, and then the actual, the observed labels and then the predicted labels. So for instance, here we say accuracy, um, given the data to the results we got. So the truth was the wine variety column. Um, and the estimate is the dot red class. So the same thing you'd guess out uh, with uh, precision. So the position also take the same, uh, the same, the same, this, the same uh, uh, format. So we start with the data. So we give the data as a uh, you know our our, our outcome, uh, which is the result. The truth was the wide variety. Um, and the estimate of uh, what was predicted by the model was the known as the thread class. So the predicted class. And we also uh, for the recall. So if you if you if you, if you um, so if you remember, accuracy was the number of instances that are correctly, um, you know, classified. The precision refers to, you know, out of the labels that the model predicted positive, uh, how many were actually positive. And the recall just answers the questions of out of the whole data set of positive, uh, out of the whole data, data set of positive variables, how many were the mod, how many uh, did the model able to identify? 
So again, we use the same syntax, which is for to calculate the recall, we use the recall function, and then we pass in all this uh, again. So, um, so yeah, so, so uh, once we do that, just for a very, uh, see what that returns, just for one, it returns a table, which is, you know, really consistent with how we do uh, calculations and data science in R using tables. So returns a table, and this really allows you to join other tables and to, you know, use deployer verbs that you are, uh, uh, consistent that, that are consistent with uh, how we do um, uh, manipulation in, in R. So, yep, so uh, like for instance here, we can take the results out of, of all this and then bind them together using bind rows. So we, we can, can we concatenate the rows of all these, um, all these uh, statistical summaries into one whole table like this. So, uh, so these are metrics, uh, uh, they, they're looking good actually. Um, yes, yeah, so we have an accuracy of 94, we have a prediction of 94, we have a recall of 95, uh, 95%. So, um, Carlotta, based on our, on our objective, do you think we've met our objectives uh, that, 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 that were outlined at the beginning? Yeah, 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 we did it because our objective was to have a recall of 0 0.95 and this is what we got here. Um, so Eric, can I can I ask you something? So yeah. um, um, so in this case, we wanted to um, compute three uh, particular metrics, right? Accuracy, yeah. precision, and recall. But what if we would like to uh, compute, let's say, um, also other metrics, so to have, uh, let's say, a summary of uh, all the evaluation metrics for our model. How we can do that in R? Oh, yeah, 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 Carla, that's, that, that's a good question. That's a good question, you know. Uh, um, yeah, you know, probably vastly because of the cam cumbersomeness of writing all this again a lot of times, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so how we do this, it's good to remember that these metrics are, they arise from the confusion matrix, right? So uh, that means once we make a confusion matrix uh, like we did here, uh, just copy this, we can do a summary of it to obtain all these, uh, all these metrics that are, that are all these uh, metrics that arise from it. So um, let's, let's see actually this in code. So, uh, so this is our confusion matrix. And then what we just have to do is uh, we'd have to do just a summary of it. Uh, so you use the function summarize, uh, no summary, I mean. So if we do a summary of that, we can get, yes, all the metrics associated with the confusion matrix. So that is accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, um, F means, yeah, so yeah, uh, I would invite you to, to check this out probably on free time and, and you know, and evaluate the, the, the model more, but yeah, that's how we would uh, you to do it ideally. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you so much. No worries, no worries, Carlotta. Um, okay, so Carlotta, what, 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 are, what are we doing next? I see we have more evaluation uh, of the model. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Let's explore another kind of, uh, another type of evaluation for our model, uh, which is uh, the uh, ROC curve. Um, so with logistic regression, um, if you remember in the introductory decks, we've used a threshold. Uh, in this case it was a threshold of 0 0.5, to define the resulting label. So over the threshold, the prediction was one. So the, 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 the category was assigned to one, while below the threshold, the prediction was zero. And this means that the decision to score a prediction as one or a zero depends on the threshold itself, um, to which the predicted probabilities are compared. So changing this threshold affects the predictions and therefore also change the metrics in the confusion metrics. 
And a common way to evaluate a classifier is to examine the true positive rate, which is another name for recall, and the false positive rate for a range of possible thresholds. And these rates are then plotted against all possible thresholds to form a chart, which is known as received operator characteristics. So the ROC cure we were talking before. Uh, in the case of a multi-class classification model, of course, a single ROC curve showing the true positive rate versus the, the false positive rate is not possible. Uh, however, you can use the rates for each class uh, in a one versus rest approach to create um, an ROC chart, which takes, takes into account all these ROC curves. So now that we know uh, what's the theory behind this ROC curve, let's see also how we can plot these um, in R. So uh, I've seen that you run the, the code, but maybe you can uh, explain a little bit more uh, what this code uh, is doing, uh, right? Yeah, perfect. Sure, Carlotta. Thank, thanks for that great explanation of the theory behind it. So yeah, so um, so yeah, so just uh, as you said, uh, taking the results, um, you know, where we had uh, the, the test set and, and the predicted class and the predicted probabilities, uh, and then the function ROC curve, um, you know, makes, makes those calculations uh, of prediction at different thresholds. And then uh, once it does that, it returns a table, which you can then pass it on to ggplot. So that consistency of talking about uh, but tidy model, so it's very consistent with other um, other packages in the tidyverse. So then we take uh, Gigi, uh, we pass them on to ggplot. So by the definition of our ROC curve, we wrap the x aesthetic to one minus the specificity, and y uh, aesthetic to one to the sensitivity uh, metric, and then we color by uh, the different levels. So and these different levels were, you know. The ones that to define, we started zero, one, and two. That's how we. That's that's the order we defined them as uh, earlier on. Um, yeah. So uh, once you do that, we can also pass um, geom upline. So geom upline just makes um, you know a, a line through the origin of the of the of the plot. So the LTY defines the line type. So line type two is a dotted line. The color. Uh, the color of the line is a uh, gray 80 and the size is uh, uh, the width of, of, of the line. So, and then lastly, to make the, you know, the, the ROC curves we use geom path. So, so, so this is a geom that, uh, that tries to trace the, the different, uh, um, the different specification of, we have put in the X and Y uh, aesthetic. So, yeah, once we do that, yeah, so this is the ROC curve. Uh, and as, as, as for intuition, the better the ROC curve is, is, is uh, uh, the, further it, the further it is from, from this, um, from this uh, uh, line that passes through the origin, the better. So, you know, it's much better when it's near the, the edge of the, of the plot. So, yeah. Uh, I think this this looks good, Carlotta. So um, do you think we can? There's a way we can get more metrics from from this ROC curve. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I mean, um, from this chart, we already can like do some analysis. So as you just said, uh, but um, um, if we need a measure a quantifiable value let's say in order to compare for example uh, more than one uh, more than one model because we are experimenting with our models so we want to see uh, which classification model is uh, the best fit for our data set uh, so in this case we can rely on a metric which is called the under the area sorry under the curve and um, which is basically um um which is ba basically um, a value from zero to one that quantifies the overall performance of, of the model uh, and, and, and is actually the, um, the area under the curve you, you just plotted. 
And a way in which we can interpret this type of measure is the probability that the model ranks uh, a random positive example more highly than a random negative example. And the, the closer this value, this un, uh, area under the curve value is to one, uh, the better is performing our model. So similarly to what we um, have with uh, other values we, uh, we saw before, like precision, accuracy, or recall. Uh, so uh, I hope I, uh, I, I answered your, your question. And if yes, let's go ahead with, uh, with question seven, that if I'm not wrong, it's also our last question of the challenge, right? Right, yes, perfect, perfect call yeah. So uh, you did answer my question about the area and the curve. It would really help in uh, just, uh, you know, go along with and just visually seeing that the, the 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 receiver operating curve so yeah let's look at the area and the curve and it's really similar to how we did the roc curve so um so what we do is uh we take the results again and then we take uh the function roc area under curve yeah and then uh this uh similar to what we did with uh uh with the the with the uh roc curve so we put in the the um the correct uh label so the correct observations one variety and then we put in the you know the predict the probabilities of prediction so that and that that was the pred zero um if i'm not wrong yes uh pred one let me check this how they were labeled yep yeah yep. pred one and uh the probability of uh uh this the second row in variety yeah and really that's that's it that's how we calculate the area under curve so let's see what area we got um uh okay yes so returns are table as as expected so our area under curve of around 99 so i mean this this fantastic uh yeah, by, by all means. So yeah, uh, and it really help if we had another model to compare, you know, how, how another model uh, area under curve would be. So yeah, so I think that's uh, that's it. That's, we, uh, we've answered all the questions uh, for that. And uh, the last question was also answered correctly. And overall, I think the model did a, a good job in classifying the wine variety. Uh, what do you think, Carlotta? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'm I'm satisfied with our model as well. And I mean, we we got we obtained our object that was obtaining a recall of zero dot ninety five. But we also explored other type of evaluation metrics. So um, yeah, I think we can move to the last step of our. Um, uh, of our challenge, which is um, actually using the model now to predict new data, the label of new data observation, because this is the, I mean, the job that the model should do, right? So being able to um, apply the what it learned from the training data set to new unseen objects. So let's let's go for that. Yeah, Carlotta, that does that, that's very well said. So yeah, uh couldn't agree more. And yeah, so let's uh let's use the model on, on new data. So first we'll save the model. So uh you know, so that we don't have to retain it all the time. And um yeah, so then we can then load it or probably uh deploy it on the cloud and then you know we can be making inferences uh when you want to. So yeah, so Let's start with library here. So this sets the uh, the working directory of this of this uh, of, of this particular notebook, um, and then we'll save the the fitted workflow. As recall, workflow has has a recipe and a model specification. So and then so the fitted workflow will save it as uh, this name here that we gave Wine MR model that RTS. Uh, yeah. So. Now, once we've saved it, we can then load it whenever we want, you know, when we want to make new prediction. This is often known as scoring or inferencing. So yeah, so the first thing that we'll do um, is create a new 
new new data, just new data we got out of the world. Um, and, and, and new table. So yeah, so this is a new table, table, I mean, or data frame. Uh, and then we can, um, yeah, use the model to make predictions from that. So what I do is we load the model. So we, we save the model to save RDS. Now we read the model into environment using read our, read our RDS. So to make predictions, we just take the loaded model. Then we augment on the new data so that um, this, the, 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 the workflow will pre-process the data and then use the fitted model to make predictions uh, on the new data and then augment will, um, yeah, uh, we, we, we bind the predictions and, and, the, and the probabilities to it. So yeah, and uh, you know, that's, that's, that's it. Uh, looking forward to see how um, these predictions look like. And uh, yep, and uh, since this would be zero, one variety of zero, and uh, this would be, uh, would be classified as one. So, um, all right, so I think that, that marks the end of it. Uh, it's been a really good adventure. Started with uh, loading the data, seeing that we needed to make some adjustments. So uh, did a factor, uh, encoded it to categorical, this are exploited data analysis, did splitting of the uh, exploited data analysis to determine the correlation between the uh, our predictors and our outcome. We split the data, uh, we did recipes to make it easier for the model to fit the data. We, uh, we put our recipe and our model into one object known as a workflow. Uh, did training, evaluated using a lot of metrics, and then save the model and then use it to make new predictions. So yeah, we uh, I think that's that, that's it from me, Howard. What 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 do you recommend uh, our learners uh, or also us to to do next? Yeah. So thank you for the the, the great uh, summary. Um, so what I definitely encourage to um, to our learners to do is to check our learn module uh, so the uh, using the link we shared in the chat because here you have a lot i mean we just showed you um the the surface of uh what is classification how we can uh, use this type of algorithms in some use real life use case scenarios but here you have a lot of more uh, useful resources and you can also practice on on this challenge again or using other exercise units um yeah so and now i would like to maybe um answer to some questions if any uh, what do you think eric yeah 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 sure 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 Carlotta. um yeah, I'm really uh, pumped to answer any question or clarification. Yeah. Yeah, so um, thanks, Rob. So the uh, first question is, uh, what is the difference between accuracy and, and precision? So uh, good question. We, we probably uh, went through it also during our challenge, right? But I think it's uh, at, at the end of the session, it, it's a good way to, uh, to recall what we just did and, um, and remember the difference between these two evaluation metrics. So um, I would say that uh, accuracy, uh, which is also the most uh, intuitive or most popular metric um, is the measure of um, uh, of how many um, how many items have been correctly classified considering all uh, all the all the items we have uh, while uh, if we uh, want to measure in particular how many items has been predicted as positive? So in the uh, in the category one, um, uh, out of the number of all the items that have been uh, assigned to the one category, uh, this is where precision can can help us. 
Uh, I don't know, Eric, if you if you agree with me, if you have anything to add on that. No, no Carl, I think you you really summarized it well. Yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So the accuracy, as you say, you know, it's that uh, takes you know what 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 were labeled, what they predicted correctly, um, you know, out of all the samples and yeah, precision, the proportion of predicted positives. You know, what was predicted positive and that was actually positive, yeah. So that's, yeah, yeah, it's simply what you've said, Carl. I, uh, I totally agree with you. Great. So thanks for this question. And I think we have another one from Jack, yep. right? Um, great. Thanks, Rob. So what are the pros and cons of one versus one and one versus rest approach? So do you want to start, Eric, with this one? Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I'll uh, I would say um, the one. You know, um, I'll, I'll I'll go with one versus rest. In my opinion, uh, especially if you're having multi-class, um, uh, you know, classification because you know it helps it, it helps you to 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 see um, to compare between. Uh, you know, one and uh, and and all the others in uh, all the other labels in your in, in your data. So, um, yeah. So I I, I I would say for multi class, uh, one 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 versus rest is uh, probably the, the the most better to go to. Yep, that's that's what I would say with that. Thank you, Eric. So just to add on that, uh, if I need to find a, a, um, a cons on the one versus rest approach, I would say that probably if we have a, a, um, a great amount of categories, um, the, the number of binary classifiers we need to build uh, increases a lot. So this yeah. would be a cons. Um, but a pros, of course, is that you have the probabilities for each class of being uh, assigned to that class, but also being assigned to every other class. While for the versus one, we just have the probability of the item of being assigned to that class or uh, not being assigned to uh, that class. So yeah, uh, that's how I would uh, go to, um, to choose which approach to, to use. Perfect, Carlotta. Yeah, that that was a good question. Yeah, thank yeah, you, thank you for the yeah, so for the for the accuracy precision. I liked it. Uh, yeah. So, but always remember to yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, These are good questions. Um, great. So, if we don't have any other questions, I would say that we can probably um, wrap up for for today, right? Um, so. Yeah, can I have yeah. a question for you? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, um, here, here we just did one model. So um, I think in the in the learning path, we also evaluate different models and we tune them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So just wanted to confirm that from you. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, of course, uh, as you just said, Eric, this is just a uh, multinomial regression model is just, of course, one way to uh, um, uh, to approach to um, to solve uh, this type of problems, but it's it's not the only one. So if you want to um, uh, learn more on other multi-class classification algorithms or also um, other binary classification algorithms, uh, you can of course check check it uh, the learn modules. Perfect. Thank you so much. Great. So in in this session today, um, I just want to remember that we went through what is classification, in which type of scenarios we should choose to use a classification models. Uh, we also saw the difference between binary classification and multi-class classification. And we also put this concept in practice by um, preparing a data set for a multi-class classification model by 
building a recipe um, and uh, a model specification and then bundling the two in the workflow object, using the workflow object to feed uh, the training data set, and finally evaluate uh, this model using uh, different type of evaluation metrics. So thank you so much for joining this session today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and don't miss the, for, the fourth episode of the series that will be um, in July. And uh, if you go to uh, the meetup of Reactor London, you can uh, see all the details of the fourth episode as well. Um, and of course, on the Reactor YouTube channel, you can also um, catch up the other episodes if you missed them. Great. So thank you, Eric. Um, have a great rest of the day. And thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Uh, thanks for joining. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to at Kawata and I. So my name is at Eric, at Eric and Tai on Twitter. So please feel free to reach out in case of any questions. And uh, yeah, uh, do have a nice uh, day or evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.